Testing, testing. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for being here. Uh, and I also want to thank everyone who is unable to be here at the moment, but is uh, remote streaming this evening's presentation, and also want to extend a warm welcome to any of our neighboring districts uh, who might have some folks here this evening. Uh, welcome to Council Rock. I am Dr. Robert Frazier, Superintendent of Schools for the Council Rock School District. And in Council Rock, we are in the very early stages of implementing a strategic plan that unmistakably has student wellness at its epicenter. Student wellness is critically important right here, right now, because students here and students all across the country are being confronted and having to deal with elevated levels of anxiety, stress, depression, and even suicidal ideation. Now, there are many, many reasons for this. And so, of course, there need to be many, many solutions to this. Council Rock, our schools and our community can be a pressure cooker. I think our kids feel that pressure. And interestingly, just this past fall, the National Academies of Sciences added a fifth student group to its list of students who are characterized as at risk. So I'm going to tell you who the first four groups are first. I think they will not come as a surprise. And then let you in on that fifth one. So the first four groups are as follows. One, students living in poverty. Two, students living in foster care. Also students who are recent immigrants. And the fourth one are students whose parents are incarcerated. When you think about at-risk students, I think those are four descriptors that would probably come to mind. Again, poverty, foster care, uh, recent immigrants, and incarcerated parents. But again, this past fall, there was a fifth group who was added. And even though as a school system we're engaged in this work, I would tell you I didn't see this one coming. That fifth group are students who attend high-achieving schools. Students who attend high achieving schools. Think about that. Think about those four and now think about this one as number five. And the fact of the matter is the CR students do achieve or do attend high achieving schools. And so I think this is concerning, especially in light of the increases that we're all seeing in terms of student anxiety, stress, depression, and again, even suicidal ideation. What we want is for all students to be well. Cognitively, socially, emotionally, physically, we want for all of them to be well. So we're here tonight to talk about exploring a change in school start times. And exploring a change to school start times is only one part of this work in Council Rock. And it's a critically important piece of this work. Do know that we are just beginning this exploration and if we do decide to change start times, that we will not make those changes until the 2021-22 school year. The phase that we're in right now is geared towards all of us, myself included, and certainly our students and parents, learning as much as possible about this topic. In fact, next week we'll be sending out a parent survey. And it's really important that our parents first take advantage of an opportunity to learn about this topic, whether it's watching this presentation this evening, reading any of the reports or articles that we have on our website or through any other means, and then take that survey. Now, part of that survey next week will also ask who is interested in serving on our school start times committee. Uh, we will need students, we will need parents, we will need teachers, all of those voices and more on this committee. From a pragmatic standpoint in terms of school start times, allow me to emphasize four quick points. First, and I hope this piece is obvious to you, but it needs to be said anyway. Given that our committee here in Council Rock hasn't even formed yet, um, please know that absolutely no decisions whatsoever regarding school start times have been made. Second, and this kind of goes hand in hand, please don't jump to any conclusions. So for instance, I have seen and heard in recent days some chatter that sort of assumes that if we change school start times in another year and a half, that that means that elementary schools, elementary students will have to come in first 
in the morning. Now, that is one of the models that's out there, but there also happen to be several other models out there. And, and that model of starting with elementary is one that personally I'm not a big fan of. Um, and that's speaking as an educator and that's also speaking just in consideration of family dynamics. So the committee that we form will explore that option and the committee that we form will explore several other options as well. Uh, the third piece here, please know this is important as we talk about extracurriculars, uh, athletics, MBIT, et cetera, that numerous Bucks County school districts are going through the same process that we are in the same basic timeline that we are looking ahead to the 21-22 school year. So there's always concerns about after school sports, other activities, um, MBIT, we're one of four sending districts to MBIT. Um, the four of us plus leadership from MBIT have been having these conversations. We will continue to have these conversations and make sure that we stay as close to lockstep with each other as what we possibly can. Uh, and the last piece here is simply to let you know that following this evening's presentation, you see that we do have microphones set up. There will be a chance for you to come down and ask any questions that you have of our presenter. Um, I also want to let you know that we have established a designated email address. It's start times. Uh, all one word because it's an email address. So start times at crsd.org. Uh, so any, que any other questions that you have that might be Council Rock specific or just thoughts that you have, please send that email. Uh, I'll get it. Several other administrators will get it. Our full board of school directors will get it. And very much we would look forward to that. So again, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to tell you that I'm excited for this work. I'm excited for tonight. We have a wonderful presenter, Dr. W Dr. Wendy Troxel, with us. Uh, this morning, Dr. Troxel had a chance to present to all of our ninth and 10th grade students at CR North and CR South. And we also had several student government 11th and 12th grade students participate in those as well. The presentations were fantastic, and I certainly expect the same here this evening. And so now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Troxel and share why we are so fortunate to have her here in Council Rock with us this evening. Dr. Wendy Troxel is an internationally recognized expert on sleep. She is a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation and adjunct faculty in the departments of psychiatry and psychology at the University of Pittsburgh. A licensed clinical psychologist and certified behavioral sleep medicine specialist, her work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Defense, as well as private foundations and corporations. In addition to being a highly cited author in top tier medical journals, Dr. Troxell's work has been widely cited by the media, including the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the Financial Times, ABC World News Tonight, CBS Sunday Morning, NPR, and the BBC. She was also one of the featured sleep experts in the National Geographic documentary, Sleepless in America. Further, Dr. Troxell's TED Talk on the impact of school start times on adolescent sleep and subsequent TED Radio Hour interview have received over 1.8 million views and is at the forefront of conversations both nationally and internationally for schools considering healthy start times. She served on the Joint State Government Commission's Advisory Committee on Secondary School Start Times for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. She and her RAND colleagues published a highly publicized and influential economics analysis showing that delaying school start times could result in an $83 billion boost to the U.S. economy over the course of a decade. Her latest TEDx talk, entitled How to Sleep Like Your Relationship Depends on It, was released just last week and already has over 50,000 views. According to Ariana Huffington, who recently named Dr. Troxell as one of the five most influential people in sleep. Quote, Wendy Troxell is on the front lines of the sleep revolution, 
again and again, her research shows just how fundamentally sleep affects every aspect of our lives, end quote. Dr. Troxell is uniquely qualified to discuss why sleep is critical to adolescent health, development, and future success. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wendy Troxell. Well, good evening. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. I thank you all for coming out. I know everybody has very busy lives, and it takes a lot uh, to come out uh, on a Wednesday night, so thank you for being here. I wanted to start by saying that uh, it's a particular delight for me to be uh, here this evening and to be um, at the high schools today, um, because I do talks like this around the country, and quite a few of them um, in this region, um, as more and more schools in Pennsylvania consider healthy school start times but um, it's particularly uh, gratifying to be able to give a talk here uh, because my husband actually grew up in the New Hope area um, and my sister-in-law is actually a teacher in this very school. So it's really nice to be um, in a community uh, that's so important to our family. So <clears throat> tonight I'm going to be talking about the importance of sleep for adolescents. Um, and I'm going to dive a little bit deep into kind of why we need to focus on the critical period of adolescence in general um, as a really important inflection point um, in, in, in the lifespan. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, some of the factors that influence adolescent sleep um, and some strategies that um, you can do in your own homes and as a community to start supporting adolescent sleep. But before we begin with the science, I want to just uh, engage in a little exercise, uh, same thing I did with the students today, um, which is I'm going to show you some pictures of some kind of average American families having breakfast, just like you may have this morning. Um, and I want you to just look at the pictures um, and feel free to raise your hand and comment on kind of what about these pictures looks like your family, uh, you know, on a typical school day and what doesn't quite measure up to reality. Okay? Here we go. From the chuckles, I noticed some reaction. Uh, you know, with a thousand kids in the room, it was it was a, a bit of a roar. In fact, anybody care to comment on uh, you know how similar or different this looks from your family? Or feel free to just shut. Yes. That's your reality, right? Yes. Yeah. The idea of actually having time to sit down. Right. <laughs> yeah. M many children actually said just, you know, the, even the idea of eating breakfast is uh, not exactly normal for them. Yes. No one's at the table at the same time. Who would have time for that anyways? They sure do. And they sure look like they're enjoying their mornings too, right? I mean, you know, they're, very, you know, they're, they're having a you know, conversation, they're smiling, laughing, enjoying each other's company as if there was this luxury of time in the morning and as if you actually enjoyed each other's company um, as early as our kids are heading up to school. And yes? You got it. There's like actual human connection happening, right? Um, what's also true that the students noticed is do you notice how light it is? Is that ever the case when our students are heading off to school? No, it's, the, it's pitch black. So first a disclaimer about the talk. Um, the truth is there's nothing I'm going to tell you tonight that is going to magically turn any one of you or your children um, into morning people, if that's not what you are naturally. And as I'll soon discuss, the likelihood that any one of you, your teenagers, if you have teenagers, is going to suddenly embrace the mornings the way those happy morning people do is really unlikely given the specific changes that happen in sleep-wake cycles during the adolescent years. But what I am going to do is try to um, help uh, explain some of the science behind sleep, explain to you the importance of sleep, particularly for adolescents, and then give you some strategies uh, to improve sleep in your own families. Um, so I'm going to cover a number of topics. First, I'll cover some basics about sleep. Um, I'll discuss some of the challenges, risks, and opportunities that characterize adolescents. I'll then talk about what happens uh, when adolescents in particular don't get enough sleep. 
Um, a little bit on the changing sleep-wake biology um, in adolescents that's contributing uh, to their difficulty getting enough sleep. And uh, then I'll end with some tips on how uh, uh, you in your own homes and in your communities can help um, adolescents get more of the sleep they need. So let's just talk with the very basics about sleep. What is it? Well, sleep is that thing we do, and we know it is absolutely vital for every aspect of our health and functioning. But it's that thing we do that occupies about one-third of our lives. That means that for a person who lives to be 75 years old, she will spend 25 years or 9,125 days of her life asleep. As stated by uh, our luminary in the sleep field, you know, if sleep didn't serve an absolutely critical function for survival, then it's the biggest mistake evolution ever made. So our needs for sleep are universal, but our specific uh, sleep duration requirements do change across the lifespan. Um, and this is roughly correlated with how our brains are changing throughout the lifespan because sleep is so critical for brain development. So adults need uh, between um, uh, roughly seven to nine hours of sleep per night. Teenagers, the focus of our talk tonight, need about eight to 10 hours of sleep per night. And younger children and infants uh, need even more sleep because their brains are undergoing even more dramatic development. But just a reminder that teenagers are not just mini adults. Their brains are still developing, and therefore they actually need more sleep uh, than adults. So what's also true is that although our need for sleep is universal, many of us are simply not sleeping enough. Only about two out of three adults regularly gets uh, the seven to nine hours of sleep per night that our bodies and brains need to function optimally. But the situation is much, much more dire in teenagers. Only about one in 10 teen teenagers regularly gets the roughly nine hours of sleep per night that their developing brains and bodies need to function optimally. And I did my own survey in you know, the large assembly that I did today, two of them, and I can tell you that the statistics in this, in this very school at the very least parallel uh, these findings, um, if not worse. So 90% of that filled auditorium said that they were not achieving uh, the nine hours of sleep recommendation. So I wanna shift gears now and talk a little bit about adolescent development. Um, and we often joke about teenagers being sort of these awkward and moody little adults, and we sometimes you sort of uh, you know, roll our eyes at their behaviors and some, sometimes um, the silly or crazy things they do. But today I'm going to share with you some data that shows how important uh, that we step back and view adolescence for the critical period of development that it is. It has many challenges, risks, and, and opportunities, and it's also setting the stage for uh, the health trajectories of these young human beings that can persist into adulthood. And so as we talk about these challenges, risks, and opportunities in adolescence, I want to share with you a phenomenon. And this phenomenon is known as the adolescent health paradox. So on the one hand, in terms of physical and cognitive health, adolescents reach a peak stage of health relative to any other stage of the lifespan. So they're stronger and healthier, um, more cognitively functioning um, than both uh, you know, in the frailty of the younger years or the declines that we see as we age in all these metrics. But at the same time that adolescents are showing this robust health, we also, frighteningly, see a 200 to 300 percent increase uh, risk of morbidity and mortality, that is, disease and death. So what's driving this paradox? This is data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which shows quite clearly that the major causes of death among adolescents are all tragically avoidable causes, car crashes being the number one, suicides, and homicides. What's true about all of these major causes of death among teenagers, not only that they're avoidable, 
but they're all related to problems in regulating emotions and behavior. And in parallel with these rising death rates, we also see, see um, rising rates of specific types of morbidity, particularly uh, mental health problems. So <clears throat> uh, during when, uh, for example, here we go, 20% um, or one out of five uh, youth between the ages of 13 to 18 have a serious mental illness. And 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by the age of 14. And this is why I mentioned this idea that adolescence is the inflection point. We've got to pay attention to what's supporting their development and what's hindering it, because what happens now is not only costly and potentially catastrophic for their immediate development, but it's really setting the stage for their future. We just focus on depression because uh, depression is one of the most common uh, mental health disorders. When children become teens, we see a 500% increased risk of the incidence of depression. And we know that the consequences of depression um, are both you know, quite significant in the short term, and they also have lasting implications. Uh, a big one here is that depression, of course, is a major risk factor for teen suicide. Depression is also a leading cause of disability from the ages of 15 up to 44. So again, this is not only about how they're behaving and how they're handling their high school years, but it truly can be setting the stage for their health, their productivity, and their functioning into adulthood. It is a predictor of a number of consequences that last into adulthood, including societal ones, uh, like unemployment. In parallel with these, uh, the skyrocketing rates of mental health problems, particularly depression and suicide, we also see significant increases um, in uh, substance use disorders as um, children progress through the high school years. This is just showing the two major substances uh, used by adolescents. Same story goes. Not only is use of uh, substances in high school associated uh, with uh, a number of consequences, but um, early use of alcohol and other drugs um, in adolescence can also predict substance use disorders in adulthood. So if we want to better understand this paradox of adolescent health, it's also important to look to uh, brain science or neuroscience research. And we know from neuroscience research that adolescence is a period of dramatic brain development, particularly in two parts of the brain. The prefrontal area. Uh, the prefrontal area is the part of the brain where reasoning, problem solving, and good judgment occur, as well as the amygdala. The amygdala controls our emotions, our risk-taking behavior, and our um, impulses. Um, and you can think about this uh, quite simply, that the amygdala part of the brain is kind of like the gas pedal of the response. That's the part of our brain that's telling us to go, go, go. And sometimes that's a really um, useful and helpful response. It's, you know, some types of risk-taking behavior are, you know, the things that take us out of our comfort zone. This can be very beneficial. But when it's not checked, when it doesn't have any sort of rein in from the prefrontal area, which acts as the braking system, that's where problems can occur. Because you can have a child, a teenager who takes an impulsive action without fully considering the consequences um, of that behavior. And that can directly lead to that adolescent health paradox. What we know in adolescence is that the part of the brain, the gas pedal response of the brain, the amygdala develops at a more rapid rate as compared to the braking system, the prefrontal area. So you have this temporal gap between the part of the brain saying, go, 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 and the part of the brain that's saying, hold on, think about what you're doing, don't you know, drive too fast, and, you know, don't engage in those risky behaviors, all these things, that, that the response that should rein it in. What's also true is that it is these very parts of the brain that are most sensitive to the effects of sleep loss. So under sleep-deprived conditions, participants will show an amplification, an increase in amygdala responses, 
and uh, down regulation of, pre uh, of the prefrontal response. So when you already have this sort of imbalance um, in, the, in the gas pedal response and the braking system not fully working, and then you overlay that with sleep de deprivation, you can have a really uh, vulnerable and risk-taking human being on your hands. So just to summarize what this national data tell us about teens, we know that um, teens, in part because of the stage of brain development that they're in, are not entirely able to regulate their emotions and behavior. As a result, in part, they're vulnerable to both mental health issues and substance use disorders, the very things that keep us up at night as parents and as a community, that clearly there's a clear commitment to addressing in a very holistic manner. And that the adolescent years are setting the stage for the health or lack thereof in adult years. By knowing these features and knowing the, that adolescence is this critical inflection point setting the stage for um, subsequent years, we can also start to look at potential modifiable risk factors that can either support the healthy development um, or identify the unhealthy um, modifiable behaviors and risk factors that we can try to mitigate um, to try to reduce the risks associated um, uh, that, that with um, adolescent issues. And that's what brings us to sleep. So what happens when teens don't get enough sleep? Well, the first consequence or symptom of sleep loss, which we all are aware of, is sleepiness. And not surprisingly, studies show that 20% or one in five uh, students regularly falls asleep in class. Now, if you're sleeping during class, I'm here to tell you that that is a real threat to one's ability to learn, right? There's no question there. So their primary job of being a student um, is going to be very difficult if they're literally sleeping through the activity. Um, but it goes beyond that. Studies have also shown that insufficient sleep and sleep loss among teens is associated, in fact, with poor grades, poor performance on standardized tests, impaired memory and concentration, reduced ability to problem solve. Some teens will even show behavioral signs that mimic the clinical disorder of ADHD. So this is also an issue of classroom management that's really relevant to the whole school system. But of course, the consequences of teen sleep loss go well beyond the classroom, contributing to many of the mental health issues that I described earlier that skyrocket during adolescence, including depression, anxiety, suicide, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Sleep problems are a symptom of virtually every known mental health condition, but they can also predict the onset of new mental health conditions. In fact, a study of nearly 30,000 high school students found that for each hour of sleep lost, there was a 38% increased risk of a teen feeling sad or hopeless, and a 58% increase in suicide attempts. So sit with that for a moment when we think about what the stakes are here. Our work has also shown that teens with sleep problems were 55% more likely to have used alcohol in the past month. So when we look at the very real threats that could really thwart the development and the futures of our children, sleep is directly related. There are also physical health consequences of not sleeping enough, both in the short and long term. So obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, we may think of these as adult health conditions, but increasingly, we're seeing the symptoms emerge early and earlier and earlier in life and studies have shown longitudinally that sleep loss and insufficient sleep is a risk factor for, for obesity as well as heart disease and diabetes risk factor factors, including in um, children and adolescents. There are also short-term health consequences of not sleeping enough, including increased risk of developing the common cold. So laboratory studies in which subjects are either sleep deprived or allowed to have sufficient sleep and injected with the common cold those who are sleep deprived are more likely to develop the symptoms of the common cold because sleep, we know, is critically tied to our immune function. And in the topic of school start times, I'm well aware, I happen to be a parent of two student athletes myself, that a big concern when the topic of school start times comes up as an immediate concern is what's the impact 
of changing a start time or changing a schedule on our athletes. Well, I encourage you to think about what is the impact of sleep deprivation on our athletes, because that we have a great deal of evidence. We know that sleep deprived teens are at greater risk for athletic injury, and they have poor recovery from athletic injury. We know from athletes um, you know, across the spectrum uh, that insufficient sleep is associated with poorer athletic performance. So rather than thinking of it as this either or phenomenon, either we support our students' sleep or we sacrifice something in terms of athletics, it's actually, uh, you can accomplish both. By supporting adolescent sleep, you're actually supporting your athletes. And so far I've talked about all these individual level risk uh, consequences that certainly are very salient uh, to those of us who are parents of teens in the audience. But I'm here to say that this affects all of us, whether or not you have a teen in your own home. Because teen sleep loss is a matter of public safety. Studies have shown that after only four or five nights of sleeping less than five hours per night, which is not something that teenagers aren't themselves doing, and it's fairly routine I've seen, that teenagers will go to bed at, say, you know, 1 or 2 a.m., and they're waking up at 6 a.m. Uh, so they might be getting five hours of sleep per night. Studies have shown that after only four or five nights of sleep restriction at five hours of sleep per night, healthy human subjects will perform on reaction tasks at the same level of impairment as if they were legally drunk. And this is not a rare phenomenon. About one in 10 car crashes are caused by drowsy drivers and young drivers. <clears throat> People between the ages of 16 to 24 account for over 50% of drowsy driving crashes. Now just to pause and reflect, how many of you would knowingly, willingly allow your child to get behind the wheel of a car or in the car with someone who is legally drunk? No one. And yet how many of us send our kids out the door in the pitch black, maybe having you know, gotten very little sleep, um, and we send them on the road and send them out the door? Same level of impairment. So now that I've told you about the consequences of teens um, uh, sleep loss, let's talk about why this is happening and why it's such an epidemic, particularly among teenagers. Remember, about 90% are not getting the optimal nine hours of sleep per night they need. So why is this? So there's actually many factors that are contributing uh, to this epidemic. Of course, there are the increasing um, academic demands associated uh, with, you know, as our kids um, go through middle and high school. There's also the social pressures, um, the, the peer involvement and the, uh, the, the pressure to stay up late and talk to friends and connect with friends. That is certainly a characteristic of adolescence. Associated with that, of course, um, is the increasing technology use, um, social media, Snapchat, video games that are... Uh, youth are uh, increasingly excessively using is certainly not helping their sleep uh, for really two factors. One, the light that's exposed, that, that's um, uh, emitted from electronic devices is blue light, which um, can directly suppress the hormone that signals sleep onset, which I'll talk in a little bit about. But it's also the content that our kids are consuming when they're on their phones um, or what have you. Um, it's you know, socially very stimulating. It can be activating. They might be wanting to find out about the latest gossip. They might have a fight with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They might find out that they weren't invited to a party or they were invited to a party. All these things um, are very socially stimulating and alerting to teenagers because they're very much primed to respond to social cues from their peers. And they're also receiving all sorts of notifications throughout the night um, if they have their phones um, in their bedroom. So all of these things can absolutely interfere with their sleep. Teens are also increasingly using excessive amounts of caffeine. Uh, you know, whether they're hitting Starbucks multiple times a day or just getting a bente, whatever, um, or drinking monster energy drinks. There's this increasing pattern of, you know, you know, like in the military, they would call that a, a go pill. You know, there's like this, this need to like take something that, during the day because you know you have to compensate for the fact that you're chronically sleep deprived. Unfortunately, this caffeine use, particularly when it's late in the day, can um, start a vicious cycle where teens are consuming large quantities of caffeine. Caffeine is a known disruptor of sleep. So therefore, when they try to sleep at night, their sleep quality, if not their sleep, their ability to fall asleep, is compromised 
So the next day, so they sleep more poorly. The next day, they're sleepier. So they then consume even more caffeine. So it can really be this vicious cycle. But there's one factor. Oh, and I should say, so all those factors are things that we can actually modify. And I'm going to give you some strategies to try to curb some of those modifiable behaviors to support your teen health at the end of the talk. But there is one factor that you know, we cannot control. And that is uh, teen sleep-wake biology, the changing sleep-wake rhythms that happen specifically during the adolescent developmental period. So for this, I want to explain a little bit um, about our circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are what control our, how our body controls when we feel most awake and we, when we feel sleepiest. And this feeling of sleepiness is largely controlled by the hormone melatonin, which is known as the hormone of, mel uh, of darkness. So melatonin signals to the brain, quite literally, that darkness is here and therefore it is time for sleep. The problem is that around the time of puberty, adolescents experience a, a shift in their circadian rhythms by about two hours. Um, they, adolescents biologically do not feel sleepy until about two hours later than adults or younger children. And this is largely dr driven by a delay in the release of the hormone melatonin, again, by about two hours. So this also means that, biologically speaking, um, waking up a teenager at 6 AM, because of the shift in their rhythms, waking a teenager up at 6 AM is the biological equivalent of waking an adult up at 4 AM. So I ask you to consider, how would you feel if somebody you know, came into your room at 4 AM, Monday through Friday, to wake you up? Would you feel you know, chipper and happy and you know, ready to do your best work and uh, you know, uh, pleasant? No. All, many of these characteristics that we you know, chalk off to you know, teenagers being teenagers, lazy, irritable, uh, you know, moody, prone to risk-taking behaviors, could be a product of the fact that they're chronically sleep-deprived and that we're waking up them up really in the middle of their biological night. It also means that, frankly, you know, because I often hear, well, this is all about good parenting. And I trust that you all are good parents. You're here tonight. You're learning about the topic. Um, I consider myself a good parent. I know far too much about this topic, in fact. And yet, I cannot overwhelm or overcome my teenager's biology. No matter how much demanding, yelling, um, threatening I do, I cannot force my child to be asleep at a time when his body doesn't tell him he's ready. And so this is what brings us to school start times and the struggle that is quite real between teens' sleep-wake biology, which is biologically programmed, they're bi biologically programmed to stay awake later and sleep in later, and early school start times. So just to make it perfectly clear, this is a simple math problem. Let's say uh, your school starts at 7.30 AM. I know it's roughly that here. Your child takes the bus, so they have to be at the bus by 6.40, 5 AM. There might be some students who are going even earlier. So they wake up at 6 AM to have time to wake up, get dressed, maybe scarf down some breakfast, and get out the door. That means that your child, your teenager, needs to be in bed. And I don't actually mean just in bed. I mean be asleep by 9 PM in order to get the optimal nine hours of sleep per night that doctors and scientists are quite clear about adolescents need to function optimally. Now, how many of you among you who have teenagers in your home or who have had teenagers in your home think it's a realistic proposition to have a teenager sleeping by 9 PM? I mean, it's, always, it's possible that you know, there are individual differences. So I could see a hand or two, but I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the vast majority uh, across many audiences that I've seen and the data will definitely show that asking a teenager to go to bed and be asleep, you can have them lay in bed, but they're not going to be asleep because their biology hasn't told them they're ready yet. So when we think about a possible uh, school level intervention to support adolescent sleep, health, and well-being, this is where school start times comes up. And the great news is that you're not the first to have done this. And there's actually now a very robust evidence base to support the effectiveness of this policy change. Uh, so the first thing, uh, if we're trying to have adolescents get more sleep, um, the question is, when schools start later, do teens actually get more sleep? The answer is they do. And I'm always asked about this um, because it's a really reasonable question. Well, it might not be, just because schools start later, that doesn't mean that teens are going to actually get more sleep because they're just going to stay up later. Well, the data shows that that's not the case. 
actually, when schools start later, bedtimes stay the same. Because kids are already going to bed when they're sleepy, right? It's just that their wake-up times get extended, resulting in more sleep. And it's not just that they're getting more sleep, it's the type of sleep that they're getting. Because adolescent sleep-wake rhythms are shifted later than adults, um, and because of this, sort of the, the patterns of our sleep and the cycling of our sleep throughout the night, the type of sleep that adolescents are, would disproportionately get in the early morning hours, right when, when, when they're waking up, them up, is rapid eye movement sleep, or REM sleep. REM sleep is important for a number of reasons. We think about it as you know, the type of sleep where our dreams typically happen. Um, but we know now that REM sleep is also critically important for learning and memory consolidation, which are, again, key characteristics and skills that are crucial for academic success and performance. But what's also true is that REM sleep is also tied to emotional processing. In fact, uh, some research suggests that REM sort of serves as this overnight therapy, because when we go through some of those wacky dreams that we have, part of what the brain's doing is filtering out some of the emotional content and stimuli that we're bombarded with during the day, a lot of which is negative, a lot of which is positive. And what we think happens during REM sleep, in part, is some of the negative stimuli kind of gets filtered out during the night, so we don't have to have it all you know, stuck in our brain. So that's why it's thought of as this overnight therapy. So when you wake teens up too early, when you wake them up hours before their biological clocks tell them they're ready, we're actually selectively depriving them of REM sleep because it disproportionately occurs in the early morning hours. In other words, we are literally selectively depriving them of their dreams and this overnight therapy. We also see that when schools start later, students are more likely to show up for school on time and ready to learn. Tardyism goes down, absenteeism goes down by up to 25%, and graduation rates go up. Standardized test scores in math and reading go up by about two to three percentage points, which is actually a fairly sizable effect by a single policy change. Students and families report less stress and their mental health, um, we see reductions in mental health symptoms. Car crash rates go down. In one district in Wyoming, there was actually a 70% reduction in car crash rates when the, that school district shifted uh, to a later start time. Now, despite all these benefits, and despite the fact that the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and virtually every medical organization that you can imagine that's commented on this topic, all recommend that middle and high schools across the US, U.S. should start at 8.30 a.m. or later to accommodate this known biological shift in adolescent sleep-wake patterns. Despite that, to date, only about one in five high schools are adhering to that recommendation. Um, so first, I applaud your school district for beginning this dialogue, for heeding the science and starting to deal with the very real challenges um, that come with changing start times, but really realizing that this is what is recommended um, by the medical community and the scientific community. So one of the reasons why it's very challenging for school districts to make uh, this change is, of course, the concerns about logistics, but there are also concerns raised about costs. So my colleagues and I at the RAND Corporation at least decided to tackle this issue about costs because of the concern that, oh my gosh, this is just going to be so costly, we simply cannot do it, um, was really a fear-based concern, not born in data. So we conducted the first um, comprehensive economic analysis of both the costs and benefits of a shift in school start times uh, in a what-if scenario, that what if every um, state in the country uh, would shift to the recommendation of 8.30 a.m. or later. And, and we also balanced this with potential costs, like changes in bus routes or athletic lighting. And again, these were just hypothetical costs, but we actually uh, made fairly conservative cost project projections so we could see what's really the benefit. And what we found was that a change in school start times delaying to the recommend, re recommended 8.30 a.m. or later would result in significant benefits to the U.S. economy. Um, with about a $9 billion boost to the U.S. economy in just two years of the policy shift, and up to $83 billion over a decade span. And these economic benefits would accrue through the reduction in teen uh, drowsy driving crashes, 
which is, of course, not only a tragedy, but also has an impact on the economy, as well as the improved academic performance and future lifetime earnings of well-slept teens. And again, even when we put in uh, con very conservative cost estimates to these models, we found uh, that most states across the country would reach a break-even point. That is, for every dollar spent, there would be a dollar in return within a two-year period. So again, I realize that this is state-level data, um, and you're going to be concerned about your local community, but it should be uh, part of the conversation that just because a school is considering a later start time doesn't mean that it's cost prohibit prohibitive. And rather, we need to start thinking about the costs that our students are bearing today by maintaining the status quo. And so with that, I want to just uh, conclude with some tips that you can take home with you today uh, to start improving um, the sleep and the health uh, in your own family. So the first uh, kind of sleep tip 101 is to set a consistent sleep-wake routine. And really focus on wake-up time, um, because this is what we know shifts dramatically, particularly in teenagers. Wake-up time is the single most important cue for setting our internal circadian rhythms, and it also gives us exposure to morning light, which is very important for setting our circadian rhythms. Unfortunately, the really dramatic shifts in wake-up times, particularly that teenagers do because they're living out of alignment with their circadian rhythms five days a week, what they do, unfortunately, is they're um, circadian misaligned Monday through Friday, and then on the weekend, they need to catch up on sleep and they basically shift into their more natural rhythms. Um, but these very dramatic shifts, like five hours or more, um, change in their wake-up times. And again, that's not unreasonable. If your child is waking up at 6 a.m. during the week, many students are waking up at 11 a.m. or later on the weekend. And I really feel for them. And I know that they do need to catch up on some sleep because they're so sleep-deprived. So it's unreasonable and probably unhealthy to force them to wake up at 6 a.m. on the weekends. But I do recommend, based on the research and what we know about really dramatic shifts in sleep-break schedules, you've got to rein in those wake-up times on the weekends to about two hours of their, their, of their weekday wakening. Um, this will help um, set their circadian rhythms and make it a little bit easier for them to fall asleep at a more reasonable time during the week. We as parents um, can also support our teens by making bedrooms, um, social media, and technology free zones. My colleagues and I conducted one study where we um, actually monitored outgoing texts of teenagers, and we found that a good 70% um, of our sample was regularly sending texts, and we actually you know, had the documentation for it between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., the time where if they were ha to have any chance of getting the recommended minimum amount of sleep um, required for that group, um, they were at se sending out texts. We also know that teens are regularly receiving notifications throughout the night. Um, we also know that teens are watching their parents. Teens and children who have parents who have technology in the bedroom are more likely to have technology in the bedroom themselves. So my advice to you is model the behavior that you want for your children in yourselves, okay? We, it's very hard to tell your children, get your phones out of your bedroom uh, when they see you marching off to your bedroom uh, with your phone in hand. So my suggestion is all family members should disconnect, unwind about an hour before bedtime, plug your phones in someplace, perhaps in the kitchen, um, and monitor them because uh, children and teens are sneaky and they will try to get to them. Um, but you know, really have them set aside and make it part of the family routine that we do um, insist on disconnecting at bedtime because there is no place for technology in the bedroom. Um, we need to do a better job of educating our communities and prioritizing sleep in our own families and in our communities. We continue to live in a culture that you know, views sleep loss as a badge of honor, uh, despite these very well-known consequences um, of not getting enough sleep. So we've really got to change that cultural attitude and uh, start by prioritizing sleep in our own lives and, again, modeling that for our children. At the school level, as your school district is just beginning to do, uh, the school level, the school can consider, consider um, healthy school start times. As mentioned, I just participated as an advisory board member on the um, Pennsylvania Joint State 
uh, government uh, commission to study school start times. It's available um, for free um, on the web. I encourage anyone who wants to dive deeper into the research and look at the recommendations to look at this. But the conclusion um, of that committee was that the ideal start time for secondary school students is 8.30 a.m. or later. And while this report did not go on to make a mandate uh, that uh, schools in Pennsylvania uh, have to change start times, the recommendation is that schools begin to consider the option. Um, in California, there actually has been a mandate based on the science that as of 2022, um, middle schools across the state of California will start at 8 a.m., high schools will start at 8.30 a.m. So that should just tell you something about the robustness of this um, evidence base. So to summarize, I hope I've convinced you about the importance of sleep, the fact that the stakes are high during adolescence. That's the only reason why this is being considered. This is a really uh, legitimate concern, and this population is so important and vulnerable. Um, and there's a lot we can do at our family level, at the school level, and at our community level uh, to support the sleep and health needs of our adolescents. Thank you. So with that, I offer you the opportunity to ask me questions about sleep. Um, I would encourage you to not ask specific questions about um, any sort of implementation strategies that are happening in your school district, because as you heard from Dr. Frazier, this conversation is just beginning. Um, but if you have concerns, I would also take him up on his suggestion to communicate with the school, because this is an opportunity to problem solve and air, you know, hear from the voices of the community because this is what matters, and then use that feedback to effectively problem solve. But I do open uh, the floor to questions about sleep in general, about adolescent sleep. Sure. If you would like, just come up to the mics, please. <clears throat> is, there any, is there any research on rose-colored like glasses wearing it at night or red filters for um, electronics? Sure. So, yeah, there, I mean, um, you can, you know, wearing sort of any sort of blue light filtering um, glasses um, certainly can help with one of the problems with technology, which is the blue light emissions. It, it, it does help block some of those. But that's why it's important to always realize the way that technology is screwing up our sleep is twofold. <laughs> it's both the light emission, but it's also the content. And it's that that sort of addictive behavior that we all now have and that sort of compulsion to keep on going, whether you're scrolling through social media or watching Netflix. Um, so, you know, we're using some sort of filter can at least sort of reduce the blue light exposure. It is not helping with the fact that we simply can't put those things down. Um, so that's why, again, having sort of a built-in um, wind down time and a period where before bed where you're just disconnecting. That's an important signal to the brain that bedtime is for rest and relaxation and disconnection from our devices. It's really important that we teach our brains that again because we're forgetting. You're welcome. Um, when you're lying in bed but not actually sleeping, do you get any of the benefits of sleep or does it like, count for anything? Or well, yeah, so the question is basically, you know, is just lying there resting the same thing as sleep? And do, are there any benefits? Well, I would say, yeah, there's some benefits in that, you know, it feels good. Um, but no, rest does not equal sleep from um, both, you know, a, a brain perspective um, or a physiological perspective in terms of the specific benefits that sleep gives you. Um, and yeah, and I think that's really important because sometimes people confuse just, well, I'm lying there in bed, I must be getting the benefits of sleep. No, sleep comes when you're actually, you know, you know sleeping. It's not the same thing as rest. My son has gotten in the habit of um, taking a nap when he comes home from school because he's so exhausted from yes. having to get up so early. Can you comment on whether that's a good idea or does that disrupt his circadian rhythm for bedtime? Great question, and he's not alone. Uh, we have a whole uh, population of many students are using napping as a compensatory behavior because they are so sleep deprived. The thing about naps is that they can actually be effective as a, um, you know, as a restorative and compensatory behavior to deal with sleep deprivation. The thing that you have to be careful about is when they occur and how long they occur. 
So the problem with many teens is that based on their schedules, maybe they're going to they come home or maybe they go to practice and then they come home and they just crash on the couch um, at like at 6 p.m. and they'll end up sleeping for two, three hours. Well, a nap that long, particularly at that time of night, can interfere with their nighttime sleep and it can certainly interfere with their ability to fall asleep at a reasonable time. So my suggestion is that um, if your teen needs to nap because they're so sleep deprived, um, a nap can be restorative, but earlier is better and shorter is better. So I would say, you know, no more than an hour um, so that you avoid that interference um, with nighttime sleep. I had a question about suggestions for children that have trouble sleeping, like I have an 11 year old preteen. She'll be in bed for an hour or two sometimes, and she's still up till 11 or midnight just because yeah. she can't sleep, and she doesn't have electronics on. Yeah. So melatonin, besides melatonin, is there anything else that you would recommend? Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned mel melatonin because melatonin is being increasingly used among um, kids and teens, and I would just caution that you know there are really no long-term studies of the um, uh, use of melatonin on a chronic basis in children, uh, so do be careful about you know, giving our kids a, a hormone that our bodies produce naturally over a long period of time. But what to do other than taking melatonin when, if you're lying in bed awake and not able to sleep? Um, well, what I do with my patients with insomnia who have trouble sleeping is actually the recommendation is, you know, if you're not sleeping and you're lying there in bed, unfortunately what happens is you start to get really frustrated and anxious. And that's definitely not going to facilitate sleep. So if you're not sleeping and, you know, you know she's trying to do the right thing. Um, so the recommendation is really in that case, you want to tell that child, you know what, sometimes we just don't sleep very well. Um, and, you know, if you're not sleeping, instead of lying there gritting your teeth and getting frustrated about it, you know, read a book, turn on, the, you know, a lamp. You know, you don't want to flood light. But do something that, so you can get distracted um, and it's relaxing, that's not technology. You might actually find that once you sort of uh, distract your brain from the fact that you're not sleeping, you might actually get sleepy and then you fall asleep. So for a child like that, you actually have to t sort of take a step back um, and um, take off the pressure of sleep because she's probably putting a lot of pressure on herself um, and worried about the consequences. And that can itself set a vicious cycle. So it really kind of it can happen. It's normal. And if you're not sleeping, just do something pleasurable, relaxing, and quiet, and you might actually get sleepy instead of working at it so hard. Do you think 8.30 is an optimal start time, or is that a, more of a compromise with what tends to work better? Um, I would say it's probably it's more of a compromise that um, sort of uh, medical organizations, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics was the first major medical organization that came out with this, kind of weighed the science and recognized that there's truly, you know, there is individual variability um, in uh, sort of when sort of adolescents you know, prime wakening time is, and it may range from, you know, 8 to 11 a.m., and then they had to also deal with the, you know, exigencies of school schedules and lives, and frankly, it's been hard enough to get schools to get to 8.30 a.m., so I think that they knew that if they were to suggest anything like close to 9 a.m., you know, there would be no chance of the policy being implemented, though, for instance, like in the U.K., um, there is... Um, uh, a recommendation that schools start at 10 a.m. So it is a range, but 8.30 a.m. seems to be at the least the bare minimum, um, and studies have shown this, where um, the kids, if you start at 8.30 a.m. or later, kids, most kids can actually start achieving that minimum eight hours of sleep per night. So if you weren't compromising, what's your optimal time? I mean, I think it would be right in that range. I think it would be probably around 9 a.m. because you do have to think about the rest of the rhythm of the day. And um, reining your kid's schedule in to some extent is probably actually a good thing because if you, know, if you think about my rule, too, of a two-hour window on the weekend, I think it's actually reasonable uh, you know, if they have to wake up at 7.30 during the week or 7 a.m. to have them waking up by 9 a.m. That actually sounds, as a parent, like a reasonable thing. It's very hard to make your kids wake up at 8 a.m. Um, if they're waking up at 6 a.m. So I think on both ends, personally and based on the science, I think 8.30 a.m. is a reasonable science-based compromise. Thank you. Does the circadian rhythm 
continue to shift later as kids get out of their teens and into their early 20s? Um, no. Well, so we sort of see a shift throughout the high school years as teens sort of progress through puberty, um, and it sort of stabilizes. Socially, the, the pressures to stay up later and the lack of parents, particularly when they, you know, leave for college or, or, or what have you after high school, that can make schedules even more erratic. But generally, we see this shift sort of uh, kind of persisting through, you know, the, the mid-20s, not necessarily, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily getting worse from a circadian perspective. They might be shifting more because of autonomy and the fact that they're living more independent lives. But the, it, I would, the other side of that question, it tends to shift back kind of mid-20s, which is now what we're considering sort of the end of adolescence, when, when brain development um, is, is, you know, further along. Can you comment on the ideal start time for grade school in case they try to compensate it by making grade school earlier? Sure. The, the question is about um, ideal start time for grade school. And, and again, I'll just re reiterate what Dr. Fraser said. Again, I think there's often an immediate reaction of, like, we can't even think about this issue because it's going to mean, um, you know, that the only solution is this flip strategy, uh, which is, in fact, um, when, when, uh, what some schools um, have done in the past seems to be a less desirable option of late. Um, I can say, as a scientist, we don't have a lot of data at all to show any consequences of early school start times on younger kids. It's just like from a data perspective, there's very little evidence. And from sort of a mechanistic perspective, we know actually that young kids' circadian rhythms um, tend to be shifted earlier. So, you know. You know, any of us who have young have had young children in our home or have them know that they're naturally awake and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, much to our chagrin sometimes, um, in the early morning hours, and they tend to tank, um, you know, by 9 p.m. And and that at that level, it's really a parenting role. They absolutely can be sleepy uh, before 9 p.m. and probably should be in bed, you know, circa 8 p.m. Um, or earlier, depending on the age of the child. So they can fall asleep earlier, and they can wake up earlier. So from a circadian basis, it does make sense, actually. If we, if we set school schedules entirely based on circadian rhythms, they should go earlier. I recognize as a parent and a human being and somebody who's had this conversation many times that that tends to have a bit of a visceral reaction for many elementary school parents about concerns about young um, people standing out at the bus stop or something like that in the dark. Um, though I will tell you that a teenager standing out at the bus stop alone and in the dark is just as vulnerable to a car coming by in the dark as a young child is probably standing there with a parent. So let's not say that, you know, it's, it's only the young people that shouldn't be standing out in the dark. Um, and, you know, they can, con they could actually get sleep even starting earlier. That said, it often, again, has such a visceral reaction uh, for elementary school parents that it may not be the best solution. And there are other solutions out there, so it should never be presented as the only solution. Um, and again, I would encourage this should be a community-wide problem-solving issue, not I'm trading my child's needs for your child's needs. Because by the way, your elementary school students will eventually be these sleep-deprived teens. So you really should think, take the long view of how can we make this work better for a community. Um, th there are lots of solutions, and again, your school is just uh, in the beginning um, process of this. One, you know, and it really, I can't comment specifically because I don't even know like the bus system here. But just like to name one, so some schools will do like um, a, 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 a flip and a push. They'll call it where they'll um, have elementary school students, for instance. And I have no idea if this is even an option. For you, so I'm just saying, for the sake of creativity, that it does exist. There are options that do exist. Um, they might have all schools make some decision that no school is going to start before 8 a.m. and then um, have the elementary school students go first. Or maybe they can sort of split the difference. So, you know, sometimes it's often the difference between, well, I couldn't imagine my child being out there at 7.30 a.m., but I could imagine them being out there at 7.45 a.m. Or you have a, uh, if this concern is buses, you have a parent volunteer who is a bus monitor. You know, you know, there are solutions to the problems if safety, for instance, is the current concern. So it's about bringing up the actual concern rather than just the fear of it, and then what are the strategies we could use to mitigate that? A 
I don't know if you could address this or not, but I'm happy to hear you're going to talk <clears throat> about other solutions to the sleep problem. But having had two kids that are now in college that have gone through Council Rock, I'm thinking 830 with the amount of homework they get every night and the amount of activities they feel like they have to join in order to get into the colleges they want to go to. I'm thinking an hour is not, would not have made a huge difference in those kids' lives. I have to say, for my younger one, we dropped back on the level of courses that he's taking just to make it more manageable. But it's, it's truly a tough problem. It's a multifaceted problem. Can you speak to, as a community, how we start addressing that these kids do not need to be involved in everything? Like, as a parent, I pull back. I say, you can do this and this, or you have to choose, and you can't do yeah. option number three. You know? yeah. But I just, if you could just address that, because I think that's a big component here. Sure, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think, again, what Dr. Frazier said at the beginning, that some of the vulnerable, I mean, the, some of the vulnerable youth are those coming from very high-performing schools like this one. I can tell you your comment is near and dear to my heart because I have a senior in high school. So I've just gone through the, the process of, you know, thinking about all the things that he is involved in and should there have been more. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, that is, I think, should be part of the community and school conversation about what are we doing to support wellness holistically in our kids. And um, there, there are increasing pressures. Um, and you know, the college application process is very demanding um, for, for, for many kids. And I think that you know, we have to, as parents and as schools, sort of encourage kids that you, know, you should be you know, seeking a well-rounded education. You should be challenging yourself. But burning out is serving no one. Um, and what we really want to be supporting is kids developing kind of resiliency strategies to um, face challenges, but not feel overwhelmed by them and part. Um, and I, sleep also plays a role there, because one of us who's been sleep deprived, I think I was a, you know, born, you know, the simplest task can seem overwhelming and you know you just want to give up when you're just so sleep deprived and I think that that is you know part of this overwhelm and burnout that many teenagers who are you know super high performing and high achieving are uh, are experiencing so I think that that sleep is part of that conversation I think part of this conversation of wellness and where sleep plays a role also involves other school policies like homework policies and I think that's something that the school um, is aware of and, and is engaged in so I think there's sort of definitely multiple things we can, we can do as families. I think we just have to um, keep on fo helping our children focus on, you know, we want you to be, you know, strong and humane and good individuals and uh, supporting their um, ability to overcome challenges. That, that's our job. Well, with that, I'm just going to pass it back to Dr. Frazier, and I thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Troxell. Thank you for those words. Thank you for the impact of those words on our school community uh, and to our school community. Um, I hope that what you just heard from Dr. Troxell paints a pretty good picture of the why. The strong why behind we behind why we want to explore these school start times. Uh, the science is pretty clear. Um, I don't know that the science is real disputable. Um, after understanding the science, people can still be reasonable and uh, not come to agreement with each other, and that's okay. Um, but what we are going to ask our community, again, is that we will have this survey coming out next week. It'll be a fairly brief survey. And so thank you for being here to, uh, to learn about this topic, and we'll ask um, all of our other parents to do the same, whether it's by watching this on the YouTube channel or uh, reading a report or uh, whatever means is easiest and best for them. And this is going to become a community-wide conversation because if you're going to change the start times for one level then it means you're going to change them for the two other levels as well uh, so we did have a question asked about hey so what are other alternatives like what are other models um, and dr troxel mentioned one of those one other that i would just mention and throw out to you would be the idea of keeping elementary as that third tier and flip-flopping uh, middle school and high school 
So middle school was coming in first, high school was coming in uh, in that second tier, and then elementary to follow. Again, they're just alternatives. They're just options. They're just models. Different school districts do it different ways. Um, I do, as I said earlier, have some concerns about starting with elementary. One of those is just child care in the afternoon. Um, you know, when a six or seven or eight year old comes home, gets off the bus, and no older sibling is there, um, you know, that's something that just inherently concerns me, but that's something that we will need to hear from from our parents on. Uh, and that that is something that we hear from our parents on that, yes, that is a concern. I'm, I'm worried about that. Um, then by all means, we will take that into consideration. So this is something that will um, undoubtedly and absolutely impact the entire school community. And that's why we wanna make sure that we do this together, engage in the conversation together. We will be as part of that survey next week, looking for committee members. Um, so there will be an opportunity on there for you to express any interest uh, if you are able and willing to do so. And uh, before we leave, I do want to remind you one more time that we have established that designated email account, starttimes at crsd.org. If you send a question or if you send a thought, um, whatever it might be, it's going to come to me, several other district administrators, and the, all nine of our school board members as well. Um, and so what we'll do with that is first just try to reply to those ideas um, as well as start a bank uh, that probably will turn into an FAQ document, but also turn into a bank of, hey, here's the kinds of things that we're hearing about that maybe we're not thinking of that you're thinking of. Um, and, and that just allows us to be better, more comprehensive, and uh, ultimately result in the best possible decision. Again, if we make a change, and there's no guarantee that we're going to make a change, but if we make a change, that change will not be for next school year. It would be for the following school year, so 2021-22 school year. Thanks so much again for coming out this evening. Please be safe traveling home.